leads off to the musicians again, who um, they somehow schnookered me into coming and sitting with them and helping out on this one. Uh, doing a great song by, by Jars of Clay from uh, back in 1995. It's a pretty easy one to sing along to, so feel free to sing along so I'm not the only one uh, singing along to it. <laughs> Gone. I, I was basically spiritually bankrupt. 
and my life had no clear meaning or purpose. Put things simply, I was just miserable. I was as miserable as you could be. The world had completely surrounded me like a flood, and I felt myself slowly becoming uh, suffocating under the weight of everything that was, that was crowding in around me. My world was a flood, and I slowly became one with the mud. And yet, in the midst of this horrible darkness and gloom, there were tiny slivers of light, little tiny things that God would kind of throw my way to remind me that no matter how dark the darkness in my own life, the day would come when he would calm the storms that drenched my eyes. And one of those slivers of light was that song that you just heard, Flood, by Jars of of Clay. And as I looked at today's scripture, I couldn't help but think, that song, both the song and the scripture, shine as a beacon of hope to those who feel the weight of the world crushing him all around them. And then they find themselves crying out in desperation, lift me up. What I'd like you to do is just keep that in mind as I invite Bob to come forward now and read today's scripture to us. And then let's reflect upon what it means to have the, the Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts and lifting them. Up. Oh, you know what? That's the wrong person. I'm sorry. I wanted your wife. Joyce, come forward. You want him to do it? <laughs> I told you you never know what to expect here. <laughs> sorry. You're a good reader, too. Oh, he can read. Okay. Luke 7, 11 through 17. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain. His disciples and a great crowd went with him. And he drew near to the gate of the town. Behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the buyer, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, Arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all. They glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread throughout the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. The word of the Lord from Luke chapter 7. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, all of us here are at different places on our own spiritual journeys this evening. But all of us have had times in our lives where we cry out, Lord, lift me up. All of us have had times in our life where we've just felt the pressure of this world closing in all around us and we felt totally helpless. I pray, Lord, that you would send your Holy Spirit now to illuminate our hearts, to teach us the timeless truths that are present in this text, and make our hearts restless, Lord, until we find our rest in you and you alone. This I pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. So today's story takes place in a town called Nain. Nain was very close to the ancient town of Zarephath, which in the time of Jesus was very famous. And I'll tell you why. In 1 Kings chapter 17, this is the location where the ancient Jewish prophet Elijah had raised a widow's son from the dead. And back in that day and age, people didn't come back from the dead too often. So this was a pretty well-known event. In fact, it was pretty much unheard of for something like this to happen. So when something miraculous like this happened, people remembered the event. They remembered it by making sure it was recorded in their holy scriptures. And they remembered it by telling stories over and over again in the communities in which these miracles happened. This isn't the best of analogies, but I'll give you an example from from our world. I've been to Philadelphia plenty of times. I grew up near there. My mom is a bit of of a historian. She was one of those people that would always stop at every single historical marker that you ever saw. So when we were in Philadelphia, I mean, we stopped all the time. It would take us hours to get across town because she'd want to stop at every historical marker and read to, to us as young kids, you know, what the history was. And then she would add to that her own versions of the story and so forth. Now, most people know the significance of July 4th. They know that this is when the Declaration of Independence was read to the masses gathered together in Philadelphia. These stories are are familiar to most Americans. It's recorded in our history books. But when you visit the places where these events took place, 
It's kind of like magical. It's hard to explain. There's something different in the air because of it. The identity of everyone in Philadelphia, for the most part, is rooted in this theme of independence. You just can't get away from it. And I think the same would have been true in the community of Nain. They would have been like, welcome to Nain. This is on the outskirts of Zarephath. This is the place where miracles have happened. This is the land where the great Jewish prophet Elijah rose a widow's son up from the dead. Jewish people in this day and age needed something encouraging like that to be part of of their identity. They needed locations like this that were rooted in a miraculous identity because their lives were tough. They needed the encouragement. They didn't have a lot of money. They believed that a despotic government ruled over them. They were foreigners who were ruling over them, the Romans. Many of their religious leaders were corrupt. They lived in the shadow of the greatness that had once defined them as a nation. They would have very easily identified with the angst that you hear in the song, Flood, rain, rain on my face. It hasn't stopped raining for days. My world is a flood, and slowly I become one with the mud. The world pushed in all around them. It caused them to lose their sense of identity and purpose. They became nothing more than mud until until Jesus walked into their world and changed everything. For starters, what Jesus did is he affirms to this community that not only does he, meaning Jesus, stand in this long tradition of great Jewish prophets, he presented himself as, as a great, if not even a greater prophet than the greatest of their prophets, Elijah. I mean, look where it is that he performs the miracle in today's reading. He does it in name. This is right near Elijah had performed the same miracle about 400 years earlier. Right in the midst of a community whose identity was rooted in a historical event that involved God's prophet raising up a child from the dead. Luke, who wrote this gospel under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, even uses the exact same wording that you find in 1 Kings 17 to describe this event. He uses the exact same wording. Any idea why that might be the case? Any thoughts? Why would he use the exact same wording to describe this miracle? What do you think? Oh, we can be a little interactive sometimes also. So it's not a rhetorical question. I actually want to see if you guys have any thoughts on that. Why do you think he might use the same wording there? Don't be shy. You're not going to be quizzed on this later. Yeah, Anthony. Because the Gospels are written as portraits, not photographs. And so he's making a declaration comparing Christ to Elijah for a specific purpose, most likely to highlight that, I don't want to say absolute line, but prophetic line of uh, the Christ. So you have, you have Luke, in other words, intentionally trying to use language to specifically show everyone that Jesus Christ is fulfilling this role of this great prophet from God. And what better way to do that than to emphasize the aspects of the event that so closely paralleled what had happened in that same community um, 400 years earlier by the prophet Elijah. And you have similar things that happen in, in Matthew, for example, who compares Jesus a lot to, to Moses. That's part of his his emphasis. Throughout Luke, you do have this theme of Jesus as the great prophet of God. And look at how people respond to this in verse 16. It says this, Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. This miracle allows the people to see Jesus the way that he truly is. It confirms that the things that Jesus said about himself elsewhere in Luke's gospel are true. If you look uh, before and afterwards in Luke 4.24 and 13.33, in both places Jesus uses the title prophet of himself. So he's very clearly identifying himself as this great prophet of God. And yet he's much more than that. He's a great prophet who fulfills the very spirit of God's law. And here's what I mean by that. In the book of Numbers, this is in the Old Testament, uh, it gives a bunch of laws concerning the Jewish purity codes and and, and so forth. And part of that law in in Numbers 19, 11, and 16 deals with strict prohibitions against touching 
a dead person. If you touched a dead person, according to Jewish law, you'd be made unclean. You'd be impure in God's eyes. It's not something that Jewish people were really allowed to do. And yet, look at verse 14. What does Jesus do? He touches the beer that the, the dead child was, was laying, uh, laying on. Now, this isn't beer that you, that you drink. This beer is, is a platform that you would lay a dead body on. But according to the, to the Jewish law and according to the Jewish mind, if you touched something that was touching a dead person, it was just as if you were touching a dead person. So by touching this beer, he was making himself just as unclean as if he actually directly touched the corpse. That's what Jesus, the great prophet, does. And then he shows everyone... He shows everyone that this ability to do so, to touch this dead person, comes from God. And he does that by raising up the child from the dead. The book of Hebrews would later go on to explain in a lot more detail than I'll do right now uh, why it was that Jesus could violate the law in this manner. Basically, it explains that the ceremonial laws, the laws that dealt with ritual purity, no longer applied to the Jewish people or to people in general anymore because of all that Jesus had accomplished through his life, death, and and resurrection. That's why Jesus could do this. That's why he could do other law-breaking things like healing people on the Sabbath. The spirit of the law was much more important than the letter of the law, and Jesus was the ultimate manifestation of the spirit of God's law. This isn't something that people in today's story necessarily understood at the time, at least not yet. And I'll I'll be honest, this is one of those things that, that I don't fully grasp and understand. It's one of those things that's very complicated. It can be very confusing that, uh, to understand why it was exactly that Jesus did this. I can't fully explain it, but at the same time, I'm very glad that he did this. And I think that's the reaction that most of the people had in today's story as well. They weren't exactly sure how it was that this great prophet could break the purity laws and then by the power of God heal this widow's son, but they knew what had happened right there in their midst. And they knew that God had manifested himself in their midst. Again, look at the response in verse 16. Fear seized them all, and they glorify God, saying, A great prophet has risen amongst us. And then they say, And God has visited his people. This brings us to what I think is the most important teaching in today's passage. It has to deal with one of the miracles that happens in today's story. Now, I say one of the miracles because I think there's two miracles that happen here. One of the miracles is really obvious. The other one you have to dig a little bit to try and, and, and find. So, what do you think the obvious miracle is in today's story? Raising of a child. Yeah, yeah, raising of the child. Okay, he brings this, this child or this man back to life. Obviously, it's a big deal. It's also a little troubling for me. I'll tell you why it is. Because I'm a person who believes in miracles. I think God can still perform miracles today. I've seen God do it. I've seen all kinds of people experience the healing power of God in in various ways and shapes and sizes. But darn it, you know, I've had a lot of family members and friends who are really close to me who I think died way too young. It's frustrating. It's hard. There have been so many times where I wanted to see God move miraculously in someone's life and either prevent them from dying or heal them or even bring them back to life. I mean, the pain that anyone experiences when you go through that situation and lose someone close to you is very real. We know that God can do it. We see that in Scripture. But we also see in Scripture that's not the norm, not not even... In, in the scriptures, this, this is where it gets hard. I'll give you kind of a, a numerical breakdown to help put things in perspective here. There were approximately 300 million people that lived in the world in the first century during the time of Christ. Okay, 300 million people. Now, by generous standards, approximately 0.08% of the total world's population dies every single day. Okay, which means 240,000 people died each day during the time of of Christ, okay, 240,000 people died each day. That translates to roughly 87,600,000 people a year. Don't worry, you're not going to be quizzed on this later. It's just to help you get perspective. Or over three years, 262,800,000 or, or 262,800,000 people who died around the world, approximately, during the three years of Jesus' public ministry. Okay, now, how many of those 262,800,000 people? Did Jesus raise from the dead during his ministry? Three. Three. Yeah, three. Three. Four if you want to count Jesus himself, although that's slightly different. That's Peter raised the dead too, right? Peter, well, I'm talking about Jesus though, specifically, not Peter. So just, just Jesus. So during the three years of his ministry, he raised three, right? 
Okay. Now, why do I bring that up? I mean, three out of 262 million, you know, plus people. That's, that's not a lot, right? This is why I bring it up, and it's something that I think should encourage us. There's a miracle in the life of Jesus that's much greater than raising someone from the dead. It's a miracle that all of us here get to participate in one way or another all the time. And we find that miracle in today's story. Usually, whenever Jesus performs a miracle, it has a greater spiritual purpose behind it, right? And today is no exception. He lifts up the widow's son out of the clutches of death in order to illustrate that through himself, humanity can be lifted up out of spiritual death. The Jews in today's story were not handling God's law right. They missed the spirit of the law. And as a result, they were spiritually dead and didn't even know it. They may have known that God existed, but they didn't know God in an intimate, relational manner. However, Jesus changed that for them. He lifted them up out of spiritual death and brought them into spiritual life. We know this by looking again at verse 16. Look how it starts off. It says, Fear seized them all, and they glorified God. God. Now I found this phrase a little bit particular, so I thought I or peculiar, so I thought I'd look it up and see how else it occurs in the context of the New Testament, so I could understand better what it meant that fear seized them all and they glorified God. Here's what I found in Matthew nine and Luke five. We read about Jesus healing a paralytic, and each time the account describes how the people reacted in almost the exact same way. It says this: When the crowd saw it, they were afraid. And they glorify God, who had given such authority to men. It's almost the exact same language. And it's also the exact same reaction to this miracle that Jesus performed. They had a miraculous encounter with Jesus, and it caused them to glorify God. Now, how is this different than any other understanding of God? As I said before, they may have known about God before, but they didn't know Him relationally. Now, I think after this miracle and after this encounter with Jesus... They did have a relational connection with Jesus. The Apostle Paul talks about this. He makes a distinction in Romans 1, verse 21 and following. He talks about humanity knowing that God exists because God has made it clear to them throughout God's creation. But Paul says humanity experiences a disconnect from God, even though they know God is there. Because, as Paul puts it, although they knew God, listen to this, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. If humanity knows God relationally, at least according to Paul, and I think we can find this elsewhere in Scripture, they glorify Him and they give thanks to Him. In Galatians chapter 1, for example, the Apostle Paul talks about his own conversion experience and how miraculous an experience it was for him. Paul, for those of you who don't, don't know, used to go around killing Christians, and now all of a sudden he was one of them. And he goes on to explain how the church in Judea, who already had a great relationship with God, reacted to hearing of Paul's miraculous conversion. And here's what Paul says in Galatians 1.23. The Judeans say, He who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith that he once tried to destroy. And then in verse 24, Paul says that the Judeans did this. They glorified God because of me. Catch that language there again? They glorified God. To truly glorify God, you have to know God. You have to know God relationally. I'll give you an illustration that might help. Quick question, and please, please answer this. Who do you think are, is one of the greatest musicians of all time? Elvis. Elvis. Okay, great. Great, great example. Now, most of you know who Elvis is. You know of him. You know his, his, uh, his music. But... Most of us probably didn't know Elvis personally or have a relationship with him, right? We know who Elvis is. We know his music. We know his impact on the world. We know his story, but we don't have a relationship with him, right? Now, if somebody here had raised their hand and said Mike Rowe was their favorite musician of all time. Oh, they're that. Okay. So, Rachel, Mike Rowe is your favorite musician of all time, right? Yep. Okay, so you know Mike Rowe's music. You know who Mike Rowe is, right? But you also have a relationship with him. Right? There's a difference. So you know Mike relationally. Some of us here even know Mike intimately. Well, I mean, one person at least knows Mike intimately. You know, I'll just stop right there. You see that my point that there's a distinction. That that, that wasn't in my notes. That just kind of... (laughs) Sorry. But there's a distinction between knowing someone and knowing them personally, let alone knowing them intimately. 
It's the same way with God. You can know who God is, but that doesn't mean that you know God intimately or relationally. Only Jesus Christ can change that. He makes the relational, intimate connection with God possible. And it's this relational connection to God that is the greater miracle that we find in today's story. Think about that for a second. How many people was it that Jesus rose from the dead? Three. Right. How many people did Jesus cause to relationally connect to God through him during his three years of ministry? Well, we can't really put a number on that, can we? Just in the Gospels alone, you can't quantify that number. And after Jesus ascended up to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit to indwell his followers, an even greater miracle happened. As many people as Jesus connected to God relationally, remember, Jesus was just one person. After the Holy Spirit fell, the numbers of people who spread the message of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus grew exponentially almost overnight. And as they went out under the power of the Holy Spirit, they performed an even greater miracle than anything Jesus ever did, just by the sheer volume of the number of people that they could reach. Now, if that doesn't excite you, this probably should. Did that work of the Holy Spirit that began on the day of Pentecost ever end? No, that's the right answer. Not at all. No matter where we may be on our own spiritual journeys, every single one of us here this evening represents a life that's been impacted in one way or another by the message of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this change is possible because that message is empowered by the Holy Spirit to take those who are spiritually dead and lift them up into spiritual life. Now those who've already experienced this spiritual life are also impacted. This isn't just a message for people who are outside of the church or for people who don't yet believe or people who don't know how to glorify God. No matter where you may be on your own spiritual journey, we all have areas where we need Jesus to lift up our spirits out of the mud of life. And one of the best ways to experience that is through regular fellowship with with other believers and through our time together in church. We need each other. We need to gather together. Because it's here when we're gathered together that we, re- that we get to regularly experience the Word of God. We get to experience the sacraments. In a moment, few moments, we're going to come and gather together at the Lord's table. And Jesus promises He'll be there in the midst of us when we do that. In fact, He's been here all along with us as we've sung praises to Him and as we spent time in His Word. He's right here, right now, amongst us. Wherever you may be on your own spiritual journeys today, I encourage you to take advantage of this time. Let him lift you up out of whatever mud you may find yourself in. And if you do that, he promises to calm the storms that drench your eyes and dry the streams still flowing. As the Spirit fills you afresh, he will then enable you to cast down all the waves of sin and the guilt that overflows you. As he lifts up your soul, you will then be able to go out like so many have gone before you. By the power of the Holy Spirit, lift his name up for those who so desperately need to hear it. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we we are a lost, broken people who so frequently find ourselves stuck in the mud of life. Lift us up, Lord. Calm the storms that drench our eyes and dry the streams still flowing. Lift us up, Lord. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit and enable us to cast down all the waves of sin and the guilt that overthrows us. Lift us up, Lord, that we may be able to go out and lift you up for a world that so desperately needs to hear about you. All this we ask to your praise and glory in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Here's what gets really interesting. Let's see if we got some. Some questions here. Hmm. Okay, in your story, you talked about knowing God relationally. How do you describe Satan's relationship with God? How does he know God? Wow. That's great. Great point. Um, great question. What do you guys think? <laughs> no, no, actually, I'm okay. I'm not, that's cheating, I know. No, um, well, I think that Satan has a relationship with God. I probably should clarify there that not every relationship 
is a is a, a loving, you know, intimate, personal, um, you know, relation of a friendship kind of, of relationship. I think some of the language of scripture is that we can call, or God calls us His friends. I mean, that's that's amazing. I don't think that God calls Satan his his friend in that regard. Satan and the demons know who God is. They know the name of, of Jesus, but they tremble at that name, and they, uh, they tremble because they don't have that, that intimate relationship. Their relationship is, their connection is more one of, of enemy or foe, if you will. That's probably the best way I could. How to what? Yeah, he met with God. It wasn't like for a tea party or anything. I mean, it was, it was, <laughs> go ahead, yeah. He started out in Right, yep. He was, he was, he was an angel. Mm-hmm. Sure, yeah. So we Go ahead, Rachel. The relationship that you're talking about is that's the miracle is that we become adopted by Christ. And we become sons of sons and daughters of God. And, sure, yeah. And Satan will never have that relationship with God. It's not that intimate knowledge that we can have with God. Yeah, that there's a there's a, a part of that relational connection is a familial Relationship in that that we become adopted children of God. So we once were, to use Paul's language, children of darkness, and now we are children of light. We are children of God. He has adopted us into into His family, and that's not something that's happened with with the devil and all of you know the, the angels that followed followed him into darkness and rebellion. Yeah. Satan was once a, in the group classified as sons of God. Jeremiah talks about the day when the sons of God appeared before God, Satan was among them. Right. As a group that he was a part of, he lost that. In our position, we get elevated to that. He was a position higher than the angels, the sons of those sons of God to become intimate family. Right, well, we, we become sons of God, and we have other benefits that are applied to us as well that weren't applied to Satan and his, and his angels, things like justification, which is, in God's sight, it's a legal transaction, so it's as if we've never sinned, we've never done anything wrong against God, and then the devil and the angels that rebelled, even though they were sons of God, they didn't have that justified relationship with God, which, which we have. That's just one of the things, there's other benefits that we have as well, and, and part of that is because the blood of Christ is applied to us, but it's not applied to the, the devil and all of his angels, at least not in a legal you know, perspective. Um, there's other ways of, of looking at that, but that would lead us off on a rabbit trail that would probably take 15, 20 minutes to, to get through. Which is the kind of stuff we talk about at our house on Tuesday night, so you're welcome to come and, and enjoy that, if I could throw a little commercial in for that off to the, to the side there. But, yeah, it's changed Tuesdays now. But yes, great, great question and great, great point, great way to draw that out. Any other thoughts or questions? On that? Okay, good. Well, um, here's one question. Is there a difference between raising someone from the dead and resurrection? I was going to bring that up, but I didn't. But because of what you had mentioned, I thought I would um, bring it up again. Is there a difference between raising someone from the dead and, and resurrection? And there is a difference between the two, and this helps you understand the difference between those three people that Jesus rose from the dead and the resurrection. The word in Greek is talking about a different thing. Resurrection is coming back to life from the dead, but it's also transforming in that you're, it's, it describes coming back from the dead in a transformed, glorified body, a, a, a um, perfect, sinless um, form. That's what resurrection is. Is about Jewish people understood resurrection as something that would happen to the Jewish people sometime in the future when they would be resurrected in a glorified form. But being raised up from the dead was something that was that was foreign to them, other than the, the situation with with um, Isaiah, and they never expected that one person could possibly be resurrected from the dead. But that's what Jesus did and and accomplished. But it's different than actually being raised up from the dead. It's, it's similar, but there's an added element to resurrection. And then in resurrection, your, your very substance is changed and transformed. And the language that scripture uses. Um, you could say transfiguration. I don't know if that's the best word for it. Um, Jesus was resurrected and came back to earth. It was transfigured. 
Well, the language that the scripture uses in transfigured, it uses the language of glorify, which is probably similar. Transfiguration, I think, is more a matter of appearance. I don't know if... So when, when Mary saw him first, and he said, don't touch me, it's because he wasn't uh, resurrected. He said he had been with the Father, because he wasn't glorified. No, after the grave, after the thir- third day, when he rose again, he was in his glorified form. Because he, he could... Him. Uh, no, 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 she said he told her not to cling to him. She touched him. She just, he was, she was like grabbing onto his leg and wouldn't let go. She said, he said, don't cling to me. That's the, the language is that she was trying to cling to him because she needed to go and... I don't, I don't think so. I could be wrong about that, but... Yes, exactly, yeah. Where, so the people who were raised from the dead died again, but... Jesus, who was glorified, didn't die again. And when, when all of us experience resurrection in the future, we won't die again. We'll have these amazing glorified bodies that... So when did resurrection first brought up How did the Jews know about the resurrection? Uh, the first reference to it, I think, is in Daniel. Um, it's kind of a cryptic reference there about a future resurrection, I think, through the Son of Man. Do you know? No. Job? Job? I know. Them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Job, and then it's also in, in Daniel and a few other places. One of those things that the Jewish people was a key part of their identity, even though there wasn't a whole lot of. Yeah. Yeah. They want to make it kind of easy for God, and they, they don't believe in cremation and things like that because I guess they want to make the resurrection process easier. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Or, yeah, Anthony. Uh, based on that question, the entire question of the day involves the story of the first kings, and it also involves the story of St. Paul's opening relation. Mm-hmm, right. And I'm thinking about the difference between raising from the dead and resurrection. In two of those stories, we have the story of the literal resurrection, Elijah. Right. But in St. Paul, you, he also describes the resurrection of sort, his conversion on the road to Damascus. Yeah, which is spiritual resurrection. Transition from death to life, yeah. Right. All right, one more, Rachel, and then we'll move on. The um, miracle that you're talking about, the second miracle in the sermon today, um, that relationship is based on the spiritual res- resurrection. Because that's what he was telling... The, that miracle was supposed to show the uh, Pharisees that they're spiritually dead and they need new life. Right. And that's the miracle that, that's how we have that res- that relationship with Christ is because we have, God may not be in the business of raising people from the dead, but he is in the business of resurrecting our dead spirits. Right. And anytime Jesus would teach something like completely ridiculous... He would perform a miracle to say, like, see? Like, you know, that's like pulling out the God card. I mean, how can you argue with that? Okay, I mean, yeah. Okay. I want to argue with you, but you just raised the guy from the dead. It's kind of hard to, you know. I would love to be able to do that in a debate with someone. <laughs> I wish I had that, you know, power. Be great. Oh, yeah, you don't think, okay, that's a pretty good argument against God's existence. But watch this. Look at that. They're alive, you know. Or look, he just grew back an arm. You know, I would love that. That'd be great. It doesn't always work that way. But, yeah, okay, yeah. Right. Uh, the, the fact that he touched that, that often, he would either be unclean or that man had to rise from the dead. Like, 
Yeah, that's a good point. That's... Right. Okay, now we gotta stop there or else we'll go on all what? One more thing? Yeah. Okay, fine. Um, you, you're talking about the law, right? The legal law. Yeah. The Dutch city became unclean. Uh huh. Well, in the earlier miracle of Kings in Elijah, he laid on the dead body and did three times. Yeah, you're right. So, I mean, that resurrection also broke the, the law in itself. I mean, what, how do they, how do they take that? I think that's a spirit of law thing versus the letter of the law. Well, the law, has, the law hasn't changed. God hasn't changed between the Old Testament and the New New Testament. So the principles that apply to Christ apply just as much in the Old Testament. The, the difference is, yeah, that the people people didn't necessarily understand that and, and get it. If the, guy was still, if, the, if the guy that Elijah raised was still dead, he would have been ceremonious. Ceremonially unclean, but he lived, and so he, therefore he wasn't ceremonially unclean. Okay, so if Elijah had, had laid on him to try and raise him from the dead, and he didn't rise up, then he would have been unclean. Yeah, it's a good point. It's a great point. That's the same thing that Great point. You guys are great. Okay, we'll stop right there. We'll never get to the Lord's table, and this is a great place where we can go to meet Jesus once again. So let's prepare our hearts.